she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons so you know, well you know how the story went now uh, there I know we say you got to be uh, temperate like in all things in the Bible uh, there's there is a danger in the Bible Adam basically hearkened to his wife's voice of the true uh, of the fruit and that's how sin came into the world because Adam is the federal head and so uh, sin spreads to all the seed you're gonna see something similar later on when um, Sarah is gonna propose to Abraham in a time of weakness to go on to his his handmaid Hagar and uh, to get a ch to get a child and he hearkens unto her voice and then you get Ishmael and um, We've had 4,000 years of war because of that. By the, book, by the time of the book of Ezekiel, 2,500 years ago, God calls it the old hatred. 2,500 years ago, it was old. <laughs> so imagine now. But if you, see, if you stop there, you can get the impression that it's always wrong for the husband to listen to his, his wife's uh, voice. There's a great danger in that. I've seen uh, families destroyed, and I've seen ministries destroyed that way. Um, when the wife takes over the house or, or the pastor's wife takes over the church, it, it's really, it's a problem. It's not because they're more evil or anything like that. It's just somebody that's not in the right place. That's all it is. But um, the Bible balances that view out too. Because in chapter 21, the same Sarah, to whom he had mistakenly hearkened, she says, cast out this bondwoman for this one woman and her son will not be heir with my son. And Abraham didn't want to do that. And now the Lord shows up and says, actually everything Sarah said you need to do. So Abraham, so she was right on that. There's, a, there's another guy in the Bible who sh probably if he had listened to his wife, um, he'd be in heaven today. Now he might still be in heaven, and his name is Pontius Pilate. I don't know if you remember this, but one of the evangelists, uh, Matthew tells us, it's pretty interesting. I wish there was more information about this, but as he's on the judgment seat, judging uh, Jesus, imagine saying that, judging Jesus. Uh, his wife had dreams. And uh, she sends unto him, you, the guy is upset, the Jews have woken, up, woken him up like 6 o'clock in the morning. He has to start like his day, he really can't be bothered. His wife is still back home, probably sleeping in till like 9 o'clock. But she wakes up, she's troubled by a, bad, uh, by a bad dream, and she sends a message to Pontius Pilate, and she says, Have thou nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things because of him this day in a dream. If Pontius Pilate had listened to his wife, he would have freed Jesus. So you got to balance those things out. Now, why does, uh, why does Adam take take the bait, as it were. Did he believe the serpent that uh, he, would, he would be like God's knowing good and evil, uh, or did he not? And the, only, the answer, we only get the answer to that in the New Testament, and Paul gives us uh, uh, the answer. Look in um, 1 Timothy, yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, Paul tells us, and Adam was not deceived. Okay? But the woman being deceived. So Adam knew what was going on. She, she did believe it, um, that's why it's helpful, you know, I mean, look, it's, it's, if you're dealing with con artists, with liars, with cheaters, with mechanics, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> not all mechanics are like that, <laughs> like, I was just joke, right, no, I, I know, actually, right now, a born-again Christian mechanic who's a godly man, still at work, probably, uh, where I take my car, so, but, you know, it's easier to kind of cheat women, sadly, if you notice, uh, all the scam artists, okay, all the scam artists, they, they target, statistically, they target women, especially older women. And they target a lot less men. When, they, when you answer on the phone, you hear a, a guy's voice. So there's guys that scam scam artists. My mom was scammed uh, a few months ago, $2,600, okay, $2,600. It's pretty, it's like, that was, that was difficult. So the guys that scam the scam artists, they, uh, they, um, to allure them, they have a computer program that makes them sound like an old lady. And they get a lot more calls from the scam artists and then they, they hack into the hackers' uh, uh, computers and delete their files. So Adam knew what was going on. That's just, that's the constitution. That's how um, God made us to be. Uh, just everybody's got their advantages. So now the question is, well, why, <laughs> if Adam knew that this thing was gonna kill him, why did he do it? And the only possible reason is because he loves her. And it turns out that Jesus Christ um, is called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he, like Adam, dies on a tree because of a tree. Because Adam hang, dies because of a tree so, in a garden. And so the Lord dies on a tree 
in a garden and uh, he does it out of love for the church. Christ sacrificed himself for the church. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So Adam knew what he was doing and he basically chose, um, he chose the woman. Which means 99% of the cases, that's, that's why a lot of guys, the one thing that will keep them away from like serving the Lord is, is uh, uh, you know, a girl. I'm not saying that because the girl is evil or anything like that. I'm, I'm saying, you know, there's guys that take away girls from the Lord. That happens all the time. But that's a struggle that every guy faces. Uh, they'll give up anything, but it comes time to the love of their lives. Oh, it's pretty hard, you know. And so Adam goes for Eve. And it brings a great tragedy upon us. But what I love with the Lord is that that same sacrifice of Adam, even though it was a tragedy, that love for her, ready to die for her, turns out to be a picture of the love of Jesus Christ ready to die for the church. So it's, it's really nice. I like that. Um, and like I told you, I think Eve gets a bad rap because later on, as you read the rest of the chapters, um, she's a good woman. Eve is a good woman. She has faith. She's a woman of faith and the Lord is merciful to her. So now... <clears throat> They realized, let me go back to Genesis there. Um, they realized that they're naked. They knew that they were naked. Now, that's the knowledge the devil sold us. He's like, oh man, yeah, if you take of the fruit, you're going to be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the first thing the Bible says we knew is that we're naked. That's the first thing we knew. He says, you're going to know good and evil. And the first thing we know is that we're naked. And the first feeling we have, the first emotion we ever have is shame. First emotion, the second emotion we have experience that, that the Bible references, right? Of course, the first emotion would have been wonder and, and joy in the presence of the Lord and at His creation. But the first emotion that the Bible references is shame and then fear. So those are the two things that people deal with. That's, those are the things that drive people to depression and the things that drive people uh, to suicide. It's, there's all, it's always some sin that's causing shame and the person doesn't know how to deal with the shame. And they're afraid it's going to be exposed. They're afraid of the consequences. And it drives them to the edge of sanity. And you can, you can go 10 years in, in a university, study psychology, and not get that simple diagnosis. Uh, but this is, this is the origin of all things. Yep. Sorry about that. I had to hang up on a passer. Never. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> all right. So, um, so they know they're naked. So what's their reaction now? They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. Now, forget the pictures that you saw in Sunday school on the felts or something like that. All those pictures of like Adam and Eve uh, scarcely dressed in a few fig leaves, you know, covering their vital areas. And it looks like some, it's not like that at all. You have to remember, those are, those are two human beings that were made in the perfect sinless image of God. They just fell and their abilities pre-flood are incredible. Those are people that at the moment of creation were equipped of God to dominate the entire planet, including the fowls of the air. They're brilliant. Okay, so what they're dressed in is not just like you know a couple of fig leaves and let's stitch them together, patchwork like some kids did the work. Think you know any I don't know Versace or Louis Vuitton. What what those two did, anybody would pay thousands of dollars to, to wear today. This was beautiful what they were wearing. It's not a bunch of uh, leaves that they're they're sewing. Did you notice that? It said they, they didn't stick them together. Fig leaves, I don't know if you ever handled fig leaves. We've got a lot of them in the Middle East, but uh, the, the leaves are very sticky. There's like a white gluish, white kind of gluish substance on them. And they, they really close nicely together. And they have the knowledge to sow. Now, they didn't get that knowledge to sow from the tree. That's why, you know, the Satanists and, and the heathen, they say, well, uh, God didn't want us to have knowledge. That's not true. He didn't, have us, didn't want us to have the knowledge of evil, but... That knowledge to sow was programmed in them. Nobody's taught them. They don't have a grandma that's saying, hey, come here, Eve, let me show you how to knit, right? They instinctively know what to do and to sow. It's, it's, it's fascinating. If you sit down and meditate on that, like what did they use they, the, the, as a needle and thread? It's, it's pretty cool. So they, they were able to do things and then they made themselves aprons. Uh, of course, aprons speak of man's own attempt to sanctify himself. A uh, cook wears an apron to keep himself clean. Leaves are a type of self-righteousness, according to Isaiah 64, verse 6. You guys know the verse where he says, uh, All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf. Later on, the Lord's going to close them with skin. A leaf, especially plucked from the tree, eventually dies and withers, and you've got to replace it. Skin, leather, you're going to wear that for quite a while. So this is basically... Man's attempt at covering his own nakedness without recourse to God 
and it's a temporary attempt. That's all it is. Isaiah 59 verse 6 says their webs, this is Isaiah 59 verse 6. He says, their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity in the act of violence in their, land, in their hands. So when we say that the fig leaves are a type of your own self-righteous works to cover your nakedness, it's not just good preaching. It's actually, there's a Bible verse for it. Isaiah says, you can't cover yourself with your works. Because that's what they sit down. They had, they had to sit down and they had to sew and cut and paste. That's their own effort to hide their shame. And whenever we get in trouble, that's our first reaction, right? We're going to fix it up, so hide it so nobody knows before, before getting finally the, the guidance to go to the Lord and confess it to the Lord and let the, the Lord uh, hide it for us. Now, the other thing is that their work is bloodless. There's no sacrifice. There's no shedding of blood in this. There's no shedding of blood. God's work is bloody. The, you ever see, you, people, they keep telling us that we are like animals, we're don't, no different than animals, just more advanced, more intelligent. You ever saw an animal feel ashamed of its nakedness? There's no animal that, that, that has a sense of, oh no, you know, <laughs> quick, let me sew something together. <laughs> <You know? laughs> there, there's nothing like that. Uh, the weird thing, we wear clothes, all of those nudists and every, yeah, that's the thing. That's why we say every heresy is true, but in the wrong dispensation. You know, nudists are right. Because <laughs> when God created us, that's how it was. They're just right in the wrong dispensation. <laughs> you know, they want to go back to the garden when it's not, it's not time yet. And you're not going to go back uh, <laughs> like that, that's for sure. God's work is bloody. It took a sacrifice on his part to cover them. Look in verse 21, just to see the sacrifice there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, the Bible there says, uh, Unto Adam, also unto his wife, that the Lord God made make coats of skins and clothe them. Where did the skins come from? Something had to die. So there's the shedding of blood. So man's work is bloodless as a sacrifice. God's work is bloody. And you're going to see that theme over and over and over in the Bible. In fact, in the very next chapter, Abel offers a sheep. Well, it doesn't specifically say sheep, but it says that he was a sheep herder. So we guess it's a sheep. But he offers a sacrifice, that's for sure. What does Cain offer? The fruit of the ground. A bloodless. When I was living in the West Island a few years ago, on St. Regis, right off the 40, right off the 40, <coughs> they built a huge um, Sikh temple. Gigantic. That thing is, is monstrous. Yeah. And it's got no windows. I think it has windows, but they're blocked off all black. Like you can't see it. It's, it's a weird, there's no wind, there's like no light can come in. Just whatever light they put inside. And uh, I was reading an article about the construction of that place in the Gazette. And, and they had interviewed the Sikh community. And they were saying what they have on the inside is they have an altar. And you know what they offer on the altar? Coconuts. Okay, coconuts. And I said, that's Cain's religion. Huh? It lives on. Bloodless. Uh, um, you know, Catholic communion, Orthodox communion. Look, it's not nothing personal. That's my background. But they, when they offer the sacrifice, it's, it's bloodless. Now, they say the wine is the blood, but it's bloodless. It's not an actual sacrifice. There's no blood there. <coughs> bloodless religion. That's, that's what man's got. The, yes? Pourquoi ils ont arrêté ou ils n'en font pas? Ils en font, oui. So, tout, toute l'humanité savait qu'il fallait en faire. Because Adam and Eve, the reason why Cain was supposed to have known, we'll see it in chapter 4, il aurait dû savoir, right? Because God says, if thou doest good, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest well, sorry. Um, the, the way everybody knew is because Adam and Eve saw what God did. They saw God offer up uh, two lambs, pres pres presumably, and then they pass on that knowledge to Abel and Cain. And then that knowledge goes on. Noah's offering sacrifices. Noah, then r r humanity is, is reset, right? Noah walks off the ark. The first thing he does, offers a sacrifice. And so Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they split off into the three continents. And that's how they go on. You'll see many times in the Bible, Balaam, Balaam, the false prophet, but he knew God, though. From, uh, he's from Padanaram. He has no contact with Moses, nothing. 
And when he goes to seek an answer from God, he knew he brings seven rams and seven bullocks. And he tells God, he says, look, I've offered them. So that knowledge had spread. We still have it in a sense. That knowledge, it's, it's, the, the understanding that something else has to die in my place is still always there. Even, you know, like people who are vegetarians or whatever, they still wear something made of leather, right? You know, something had to die to hold my pants up. And something had to die to, to cover my, my feet. That's a sacrifice. Now, modern culture is so far removed from the, from the supply chain, right? The source of production that... I kind of joke that this generation thinks that like hamburgers just show up on the shelves of an IGA, but they don't realize, but this stuff is, is something died for me to cover my nakedness still till this day, till this day. You can't avoid it. It's in the subconscious. It, it, it lives on, you know, the aprons, you know who wears aprons as part of their religion? When, when you get initiated, the, fr the Freemasons. Freemasons, they're given an apron to wear during one of the ceremonies. That, that, that's what they give them. They give them an apron. Now they, and then they talk about the lambskin. They do talk about the lambskin. But that sends you back right, right to man's own, uh, own ability to, uh, um, or, or presumed ability to, to cover his nakedness. This, by the way, uh, the question gets asked a lot, especially by parents, like, when do my kids reach the age of accountability? How do you know if a child has reached the age of accountability? Because we know from the Romans chapter 5, and from the death of David's son, that children who die before they're aware, before, and from Exodus, that children who die before they have a knowledge of good and evil, they, have a, they inherited the sinful nature, but they don't inherit the guilt of the sin. They're, they're, in, they're presumed innocent. God himself says that, all right? Uh, so in the, uh, in the Exodus, he says, everybody that was under 20 years old who didn't have knowledge of good and evil is spared. That's pretty gracious of God to give till 20, okay? But I, I think the best answer that, that I see in the Bible for that is exactly Adam and Eve in the garden were like kids running around naked, right? I think the moment that that child starts realizing that, starts feeling that shame, you're, they're about to hit the, the age of accountability. Because Adam and Eve, it's when they sinned, they felt the shame, right? So, and this was something that they were accountable for. They technically, if you want to be technical, like non-technical, they kind of had sinned before because Eve doesn't quite quote God right. See, she messes up his words. Adam doesn't keep the serpent out of the garden, but there was no direct commandment in relation to that. So I think that's when you see your children start. Um, now you can kind of awaken the kids a little too early to that by yourself, like, kind of like oh, that's, no, don't do that. But if, you, if left to their normal development, as a parent, once I see my children start, to re start being ashamed of their nakedness, then I know they're starting to get ready to understand that you know, I'm a sinner and they, they start becoming uh, accountable towards God at that point. Okay, uh, okay, verse 8. Verse 8 now, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Oh, man. Imagine if we could go back to this. And Adam and his wife uh, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, uh, Where art thou? They could tell he was walking by his voice, which is kind of a... Odd. Later on, uh, Abraham is going to meet God during the heat of the day. And uh, you, want, you want a little kind of interesting nugget how God keeps his own word? Uh, in Ephesians, now the Lord knew what was happened. And he was pretty angry. Uh, but doesn't the Bible tell us in the New Testament, let not your, the sun go down upon your wrath? And look how God shows up in, in, the, in, in the cool of the day, presumably the evening, to get it solved before, before the sun goes down. It's pretty nice, but the Lord always keeps, keeps His word. <clears throat> uh, all right, I have to skip a lot of the stuff here, but um, uh, verse 10, Adam's answer. Did I read verse 8? Yeah, I read verse 8. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked uh, and I hid myself. So when we're for, that's how we function. That's human psychology right there. When we're afraid to get caught, the first thing we do is hide. You know, the <laughs> I've got a really cute uh, picture of my daughter. We told her not to go towards the chips. And uh, she really likes chips, the younger one. And um, I walked into the kitchen one day and... Uh, I saw the, you know, there's one of the closets that open like this. Both doors were closed, but they couldn't close completely because she's sitting behind them, 
but she's sitting inside the closet <laughs> and only her feet are showing from underneath the doors and I'm looking through the slit and I see one eye looking, one eye, because she's looking back and the feet, the cute little toes are right there and she, now she's convinced she can't, I can't see her. <laughs> you know? And then you do one of those numbers like this and she's looking up at you like that. And you're torn between being angry and, and finding it cute. That, that's, you know, that's, a, that's completely pointless to hide behind the trees. And the Lord, of course, has questioned to Adam. He knows where he is. And he says, Adam, where art thou? He's asking him to take stock. Like, look, look around. Look at what this situation has got you in. Later on, he's going to say, uh, he's going to ask a similar kind of question to Cain. Where is thy brother? And the reason why we, the idea behind that, uh, it's funny, eh? some people attack passages like that in the Bible. It's just incredible. Like, well, God didn't know. Well, come on, like, as a parent, and you're chastising your child, like, so what, now what did you do? Uh, we know very well what they did, but what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to get them to confess, to take stock of the truth and be honest with themselves and, and assess the damage that was caused by the situation. Because I don't want to force a confession out of them. I want them to confess it, then there's hope. So that's what the Lord is doing. Adam, where art thou? Like, tell, you tell me what you did, you know. So the Bible is really helpful, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the, the Bible says that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what the Lord had, was, was doing uh, right there. There's all, those are first, the, you have the question where in 3.9 in the Bible, who in 3.11, what in 3.13, and why in 4.6. The main questions of, of, that we face as, as humanity. So the... Uh, <clears throat> Man, there's so much in there. Okay, the, um, there's a really strange thing going on in verse 10 in Adam's answer. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. Well, hold up. He's not naked. He's dressed in fig leaves. He has an apron on. Okay, it's, it's fun. We, in the pictures, again, in the Sunday school picture, I mean, God bless the people who do them, but they'll draw them naked, hiding behind the trees. But they weren't because of that, but they weren't. We've, they have the aprons on. You know what that tells you? Between each other, because they weren't hiding from each other until God showed up, right? They weren't hiding, they hid together, they were together. Between each other, the aprons did fine. They felt no guilt, no shame. But in the presence of God, all of a sudden, even the thickest covering was not enough to his piercing gaze. That's why like the good works vis-a-vis -vis others, you know, we feel good about everything, we, the nice stuff we do to cover our sins. But when it comes to God, you're still going to feel naked, even if you have all the best works in the world. You know, Mother Teresa, she's going to stand before God in the great, uh, the great white throne judgment, and she's going to feel naked. She's going to feel naked. Now, I, I don't say that completely. I say that based on the Bible and based on the book she wrote. I don't know if you have a chance, but check it out. She, she wrote an incredibly depressing book where she doubts the existence of Jesus in it. Doesn't matter, man. In the, in the eyes of God, we all do fade as a leaf. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. They had those beautiful aprons on and they still felt naked in the eyes of God. And verse 11, and he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I command thee that thou shouldest not eat? Again, the Lord doesn't, he knows that it's not Adam that figured out on his own that he's naked. Somebody else, you know, again, like, you know how you raised your kids and they say some word, right? Some bad word, you're like, where did you hear that? <laughs> you know that somebody older, most of the time, that's how we got into sin as young people. Most of the time, somebody older introduced us to sin. <laughs> Who told you that? Who, that's, that's what's so uh, dangerous, man. Like, it's the devil that tries to awaken us uh, to sinful pleasures as though there were some kind of, as, and, and just show us the pleasurable part without the shame and the guilt and the suffering that comes with it. Books can do that. Movies can do that. Anything can do that. That's why we preserve uh, the innocence of our children as, as, uh, as long as possible. <clears throat> so, first question ever asked in the Bible of God is who? God's first question ever is who? 
There's no sin if there isn't a sinner. David said that the Proverbs of the ancient was that wickedness proceedeth from the wicked. So God, of course, God knows what's going on. Um, so he's like, you didn't learn for this from me. Who told you? Who, 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 have you eaten from the tree? Somebody influenced you. Somebody manipulated, pressured, influenced you and, and set you up. Now, the tree, <laughs> uh, Satan and the tree are connected. Because, n look, nobody told Adam that he's naked. It's eating the fruit. It wasn't even the devil. I don't think you notice that. It, the devil didn't say you're naked. And God knows that, of course. It's eating the fruit that got them to feel naked. But the Lord's question is not what, is who. Even though it's the, it's the act of eating the fruit. So there's some, mystical, there's some mystical connection there between that fruit and the devil. You want to keep that in mind uh, for, for later on. In fact, you guys remember very well, we've done Daniel together now. Nebuchadnezzar is compared to a tree, who's the type of the Antichrist. In Daniel chapter 4, where the tree is cut off. And the Assyrian Antichrist in Ezekiel chapter 31 is compared to, to a tree. All right, so, uh, verse 12, and the man said, of course, the first um, blame the other person game ever played in human history. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. C'est pas ma faute, it's not my fault. She told me, he told me, they did this, they made me do it, right? We're always blaming somebody else or the devil. When, now, when he says the woman, uh, he's blaming his wife. <laughs> but when he says, but he doesn't just say the woman, he says, the woman whom thou gavest <laughs> to be with me. Indirectly, he thinks, is that your fault? <laughs> We're good, huh? Uh, chill, man. We're good. We've done it to, to our parents. Our kids do it to us. That's just a guilty man speaks of his wife. And not, I know, yeah, it's not, honey, my dear one, my beloved. So, yeah, the woman. All of a sudden, it's just the woman, you know. You know, when the kids mess up, look at your kids. <laughs> like, I had nothing to do with that. That comes from your side of the family. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're, we're, just, we're just so bad, man. Verse 13, and the Lord God said unto, now it's, it's it, here's what's interesting, that the Lord goes with it. <laughs> like he's talking to Adam, and notice he comes to Adam first. Okay? He comes to Adam first. He's the head. He was supposed to keep the serpent out of the garden, so he comes to him first. There's a lot of, there's a lot of men that will blame the bad stuff on the wife, but like, listen, we, ha we do have some degree of responsibility. Not all of it, not all the time, I understand that. But the Lord does come to Adam first, so... <clears throat> Uh, and then he moves on to the woman. Verse 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, Pass the blame, The serpent beguiled me, Who you did create. <laughs> <laughs> and I did eat. Now what happens there, of course, uh, We already saw in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul likens our problem with the devil to the Eve and the serpent. Because uh, the serpent beguiled Eve and, and the serpent can beguile the church. Um, <clears throat> no matter what, who you are in life, no matter what you do, all our life is a replay of this. That's, that's, that's all it is. Somebody older than us got us into sin. We were innocent. And then we tried to fix the problem ourselves. Then when it was discovered, we blamed our circumstances and we blamed God. And that's it. The devil made me do it or God, made, or God, it's your fault. That's it. Everybody, everybody denies Genesis chapter 3 and everybody lives Genesis chapter 3 as they're denying Genesis chapter 3. There's, there's, there's some psychology and stuff that in there. That you, it's just very deep. Um, now, here's what's interesting. The Lord had told him, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Eve is still alive. So she sees that for now, at least, I've eaten the fruit and I'm still alive. So, but she still knows that the devil beguiled her. Because she says the serpent did beguile me. She knows something went wrong. She already feels it in her body. And she feels it in her conscience. So in verse 14, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, now he moves up to our old enemy, because thou hast done this. Thou art cursed above all cattle. Isn't that interesting, right? We talked about that. Serpent probably had legs and even wings. And above every beast of the field, 
Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of, li of thy life. And by the way, that's what, uh, again, every heresy is a partial truth. Evolution is a lie. Adaptation is not. Adaptation is biblical. Right? The first hint of, of, of what, what today pseudo-scientists falsely describe as evolution is actually from the Bible. We were evolutionists before anybody else in the sense of how, in the sense that we believe that changes in the environment cause changes in the DNA and bodies to adapt accordingly. But so, because that's in the Bible, God says there's an anatom anatomical transformation that will happen to the serpent, not just anatomical, there's going to be one which is uh, digestive. You know, for the serpent to start eating dust from whatever it was eating, there's a change in the digestive system too. So now there's, there's studies like they see that there's more people becoming intolerant to, to milk. And they're saying, oh, that's part of evolution, you know. Listen, <laughs> but the serpent from 6,000 years ago is still what? Still a serpent. Adaptation is biblical. In fact, we know from the Bible that the Bible itself tells you, the prophet Isaiah tells you that in the millennium, you, you know what the uh, lion's going to eat? Grass. Yeah. Grass and straw. Now, you think the lion's going to be eating grass and straw with canines jutting out of his maxillaries like this? That involves the transformation of the jaw and of the digestive system and of hunting habits because there's no more hunting and eating habits and the claws. Th they're going to change anatomically. They adapt to the environment, but that has... But the lion is still going to be a lion, and the serpent is still a serpent, and the butterfly is still a butterfly. So when you, so don't get like, you know, this could too far, young people, because they go to college. And this, honestly, this is what they do. McGill University, you know what they present as a, as a proof of evolution? They'll put like algae, like a blue algae or green algae, and then after like, you know, a few days in a certain environment, the algae becomes blue. No, I'm not even kidding. That's the examples they give. They're like, see, it became blue. <laughs> but it's, yeah. <laughs> we don't. That's, that's not evolution. It's still algae. So God is a master engineer. The, what, uh, those, by the way, those transformations, the code, the genetic code is already there. It's just not expressed. So it gets expressed differently. Darwin, when we travel to the Galapagos Islands, I'll come right to you, brother. When he went to the Galapagos Islands and he saw different beaks of the same species, but on different uh, islands, and he saw that the beaks were adapted to whatever the environment was there, but the information for those beaks, for all those types of beaks, is there in the code for all those birds. So there's not like added information in the genome. And this flexibility that's built by a master engineer. Guys, people build bridges today. We've got them here in, in Canada, right? The temperatures here vary from like minus 45 to plus 45. We've got 90 degree variations within a single year. That's brutal on infrastructure and buildings. So when you're driving on like on the Champlain Bridge and you go do 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 there's, you've got those spaces there with the teeth between them. Those are engineered that the bridge can contract and expand without breaking. There's a flexibility there in the structure of the bridge. God does the same thing uh, uh, in, in the animals. There's like furry Chinese monkeys that are like, live in the absolute snow, cold. And they've got like short noses so they don't get frostbite. That's not evolution. That's, it's that monkey is still going to stay that, that monkey. There's, so they're two, two, different, two different concepts entirely and they're not related. Yes, sir. million years old like yeah. to justify the, the length uh, of a right. And uh, you said also that if we, we say that, um, that Isaiah tried to um, uh, warn the Jews like uh, that they're trying to hide in their um, uh, words, yes. uh, as you said, uh, that's what they call the misbots. Misbots? Misbots, um, wh what they're trying to do to um, when the, their salvation yeah. is by work. Right. Okay, okay. Yeah, they're trying to earn it by their works. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And then, yeah, for the, uh, I'm not sure if it was a question about the timeline there, the 250 million years. Uh, it was about, uh, I don't have the words uh, exactly. So yeah, but so because, because evolution has never been observed in a lab, they just say, well, they have to push back the timeline in credit to, to absurd length of time. Um, to account for the lack of observation, current observation. Um, yeah, those guys were trying to justify themselves by their works. And you can't, you know, not absolutely. Even under the law, you couldn't. You can't. Absolutely, you can't. 
Uh, we all break the laws, unfortunately. Uh, all right, so now this is the first curse in the Bible ever, and it falls on the serpent. I really do believe, I know some people laugh at, at, at that idea that there's some kind of spe special enmity between the woman and the serpent because of that story. I don't know, man. I'm not so sure that I would laugh at that idea. I know, I know some women like serpents. My mom likes serpents, okay? So, sorry, mom. <laughs> she finds them fascinating. But by and large, by and large, I really do think there's some kind of enmity, uh, enmity there uh, between the two. Those are dangerous, dangerous creatures. Um, so that's the first curse in the Bible. The first blessing in the Bible is upon animals. It's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 22. And the first curse in the Bible is upon an animal, which, is, which I find pretty interesting. Now, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, for he that is hanged, accursed of God. So why is that? You know, you gotta, you gotta, why is it that hanging, death by hanging, is a, there's a special curse for death by hanging if you hang on a tree? Because it goes back all the way to Genesis chapter 3, which is the origin of all sin. We sinned because of a tree. That's why the Lord had to die on the tree. That, that cross, Peter calls it, the, he calls it the accursed tree. Jesus died on the accursed tree. As he's rejected of heaven and of uh, heaven and earth, you're kind of hanging in between. <clears throat> uh, verse fourteen, yeah, we saw that already. Verse four, we saw that. We saw that. Let me just go down my notes. Verse fifteen. Oh, this is beautiful. Now this is where it gets good, guys. I love it now. The this is the first clear prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, everything hinges on this verse here, right here. God tells the serpent, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And what I, what I would, what blesses, I hope that blesses your heart. See, the devil thought he had won because he, he went to what Peter calls the weaker vessel. And, and, and he went to the lady because he knew she's, she's sweet and she's kind and she's compassionate and she's naturally going to entertain such a conversation and, and, and he's going to prey on her, on her fears and doubts and gets her to fall. And he feels like, and I got Adam too. And like, they, they, I've got them both. And what the Lord does is that when he announces that there's going to be a, a, a redeemer of mankind, he, he makes a point to tell the devil that that salvation is going to come from a woman. He makes the point. Like he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. So he could have just said, there's going to be a seed, you know, there's going to be a Messiah. But he, he take, and what it is, it's like, yeah, he, basically what the Lord says, like that, that little girl that you defiled and that instinct, that instancy that you stole and you think that there's nothing that can be done anymore from that same thing that you did, from that same woman I'm going to bring out Something is going to fix this whole situation. I love, I love how the Lord works. It's just wonderful. Uh, there's some specifically designated seeds in the Bible. Uh, we'll see that uh, a bit later on. But there's a lot here that's uh, uh, going on. He says, I'll put enmity. And he's talking to the serpent. And he says, thy seed. And he says, her seed. Now we know who the seed that Redeemer ended up being. Because, you know, from Eve uh, right down through the line. Eve being a type of Mary, a figure of Mary. And the seed, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So, was he a flesh and blood human being that walked on the earth? Right? Born of a flesh and blood woman. Right? Made of woman, the Bible say. We should stick with the Bible terms. Well, <clears throat> so what's the implication for thy seed then? <laughs> right? Same thing. People who say that the Antichrist is only a system and it's not going to be a person, it's the seed of the serpent. Christ? An antichrist. And from there, from that point on, this is why your Old Testament is so 
concerned with genealogies. The, the New Testament, not so much. Actually, not at all. You say, yeah, but Matthew and Luke, Matthew and Luke are Old Testament for the cross. It's still Old Testament context. New Testament, if you're in Christ, who cares where you come from? <laughs> doesn't matter what you are, what gender, what, what sex, what ethnicity, it doesn't matter. You're in Jesus Christ and you're getting a new body and you're, you're part of a heavenly people that's completely, almost completely diverse from the planet. It's irrelevant. However, back, see, like it, the, it's the whole Old Testament, oh, uh, Eve thinks, oh, it's Cain. Nope, no, nope, mistake, it's not Cain. Then it's Seth. And then from Seth, the Bible focuses on a series of men. So it goes to Enoch, Jared, Lamech, Methuselah. Then it goes to Noah, uh, Methuselah, Jared, Noah. Then it goes to uh, Shem. And from Shem, you end up with Abraham, Abraham, Isaac. So, and then Sarah, she's almost taken by the king and she's defiled. And, and uh, Rebecca, her womb is closed. And Sarah was barren and Rebecca is barren and Rachel is barren, right? And then you go to Judah and then... Uh, 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 from Judah, you've got Pharaoh and Zerah, but it's Pharaoh that's, that's chosen all the way down to David, and from David all the way down to, to Jesus Christ. The reason why the Old Testament has so many genealogies is because mankind has been looking for that Redeemer. The devil has been looking for him to kill him, as evidenced by King Herod who wanted to kill him. And the Lord's been trying to run, navigate through all the sexual sins of his people <laughs> you know, to get to a point. This is why the giants show up later on Genesis chapter 6. And there's so much emphasis on sexual sins in the Bible, especially in the book of Genesis. There's 18 instances of sexual sin in the book of Genesis alone. 18. Because that was what... So that, now here's what you want to keep in mind. That prophecy is communicated directly to the serpent. And it's communicated to Adam and Eve. All right? So they both... So humanity knows that there's a supernatural seed that's coming. And the devil knows that there's a supernatural seed that's coming. That was revealed of God to the devil. Now that will explain the genealogies, the sexual sins in the Bible, and it'll explain something else. It'll explain why so many ancient cultures have a prototype, a narrative of like a supernatural seed born of a woman that's a superhero. Now, a lot of people today, it's been kind of the, the academic trend for about like, I don't know, 40 years now to say, no, more than that, more than that. There's a guy that wrote a book called The Golden Bough, and it's, a, it's kind of the first book of modern comparative religion. Uh, almost everybody's forced at some point to take some kind of course, civics course on comparative religions. And there's a movie about it, and the whole thing that Christianity, what Christianity is, is just a, a rebranding of a pagan narrative that peoples of all cultures always believed that there would be... Uh, some kind of supernatural born son to a woman and he'd be the savior and Jesus is just in the list of those mythologies right but he just became the more popular one so I don't know if you ever studied some Greek mythology but uh, like I forget her, her his mom's name but Achilles you know the the, the Bozeman in almost invincible and what it was it says his mom she dips him in the river Styx uh, and he's invincible but because she was holding him by the heel when she dips him, because the, the myth goes, whoever is dipped in the river of the dead, when they come out, they're invincible. But because she was holding him by the heel when she dipped him, his whole body is invincible except for the heel. And then the stray arrow at the Battle of Troy hits him in the heel and he dies. And of course, anybody reads that, you can tell it's Jesus Christ all over. He's, he's, he's invincible, but he has one weakness. And the Bible says, what does God say in Genesis chapter 3? It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heal so people see that and they say well that's Achilles now Achilles comes much later well, here's what they don't tell you though in the schools they don't tell our kids that Achilles first of all came a lot after Moses <laughs> a long time after Moses so here's what they say they say I can show you the heathen parallels to the Christ being born of a virgin I can show you heathen parallels before Christianity well, yeah, you can show me that before the New Testament, but you're not showing me something older than the Old Testament. They say, yeah, we can, because there's writings older than the Old Testament. But that information is revealed to Adam. He's the first man. So that promise, look, Eve takes it really to heart. When, Cain, uh, when, when she gets pregnant and she, and she gives birth to Cain, you know what she says? She says, I have gotten a man from who? From the Lord. She, so for her, she thinks in my generation, that because God promised us a seed that's going to redeem us. 
He's going to destroy the serpent who God has destroyed. So she gets Cain. She's all excited because she thinks my son is going to be is going to save me, which is true in the case of Mary. Her son does save her. God, my savior, she says. And then Cain is wrong. So Cain ends up to be a type of the Antichrist. So then Seth comes. And when she gets Seth, she says, uh, God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. Now she knows that it was Abel. It was supposed to be the right line. Whom Cain slew. So, so in her mind, she goes, Cain, no. Uh, oh, it was Abel, but Abel's dead now. Okay, now it's Seth. So she's looking for that seed. Now, so that promise gets communicated to everybody all the way down to Noah. And if you ever, when we get to Genesis 5, you're going to see that there's not too many generations between Adam and Noah. You know that Adam almost met Noah? Did you know those boring genealogies, all the, the dates of how, they, how long they lived and the, 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 uh, how old they were when they got their firstborn son. If you sit down and you overlap their ages, Adam dies, I think, in the, in the days of, Jer uh, of Noah's dad. So Adam almost sees the flood. So it goes from Adam to Noah's dad to Noah to Shem, the information. So that, and this is thousands of years because they lived what? They lived 900 and 800 and 900 years. So the information, the oral information, the gap is not big at all. It's basically three generations from Adam to like, it's, uh, it ends up being nine generations from Adam to Moses. Just nine generations. So the reason all those cultures have that is because God gave that promise to all those cultures. <laughs> That's why they had that. But with time, what happened? With the devil working, it got corrupted. It got corrupted. So you say, well, Christianity, but that was heathen first. Yeah, but it was biblical. It became heathen, and the New Testament repurified the reality of, of uh, the story. So he's coming. As sure as, as Jesus Christ came in flesh and blood, that guy's coming, and uh, he's going to be he's gonna be the Antichrist. The other thing, too, is, is that uh, a woman doesn't have seed. It's a man that has seed, so you, you all know basic biology there. And uh, so there is, within that prophecy of the Lord, there's a hint of a supernatural birth. There's a hint there. And of course, uh, Jesus Christ turns out to, to be born of uh, the Holy Ghost of God. Uh, I'm just skipping through my notes. Yeah, the, the importance of Bible words. Look at the Bible word there. I caught on to that once while I was helping a sister do a French translation of the King James Bible. And, the, and so, for example, a lot of Bibles here, instead of bruised, it shall bruise thy heel, it says crush. You know what the problem with that is? If you say crush, you have a Bible contradiction. Because if he crushes the heel, if he crushes the bone, le talon, then you've broken a prophecy about Jesus. You know what that prophecy is? He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. And that prophecy is quoted in the New Testament. John quotes it. He says, this is why the thieves on the cross, they were still breathing and they had to put them down because it was a high Sabbath the next day. So they had to accelerate their death. So they broke their legs. So they couldn't pu push themselves up to breathe and they died asphyxiated. When they got to Jesus, he was already dead. They didn't need to break his bone. So it's not crush, it's bruise. It's bruise, very important. You change sometimes a word and you really mess up a, mess up a doctrine. The other cool thing here, uh, let me write it down. Let me erase there, go back on the board. That's one of the things that when I learned really, really blessed my heart. You've got both comings in what God says to the devil. Both comings are there. What a day it's going to be when the Lord comes back. What a day. He says, um, He says, It shall bruise thy head. Sorry if it's a bit small, but I mean, you have the text right in front of you. It shall bruise thy head um, 
Voilà. And he says, uh, um, thou shalt bruise his heel. Thank you. By the way, take off the H and the O. You have the French too. Really? No, they are they are connected. It's not, yeah, it's not, it's not really etymology. They're connected. Thou shalt uh, bruise. Yeah, bruise. Right. Same verb. Yeah, yeah. I just said it. <laughs> bruise his heel. Thou shalt bruise his heel. It's not apparent at first. And this is this is important. This this will open up the, your Bible on some things. Now, what, what, what I was taught, and what 95% of Christianity teaches, uh, and it's not like some kind of wicked, bad her heresy, but, but it's wrong. They teach that <clears throat> those two things are the same, and they happened, both of them, at the cross. So they teach Jesus bruised the head of the serpent on the cross. Now, there is kind of a verse that can kind, kind of um, back that up. Look in Colossians chapter 2. Those are the two comings. That, this is the biggest, the, the theme of the Bible. This is the major, the biggest issue of the Bible. The biggest doctrine, the most important issue in the Bible. Colossians chapter 2. And that's really kind of the only verse that can be used. But it doesn't say what Genesis says. Look, Colossians chapter 2. And uh, verse 13, verse 13. So Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13, please. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. And the Paul there tells us, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So Paul is saying, Jesus triumphed over. Uh, fallen angels in the cross and he did so, the, the, so you have to keep in mind that the Lord when he died he also went underground right and he preached unto the spirits in prison it doesn't say souls spirits the angels are always spirits in the Bible uh, one of the things that the Lord did Hebrews here's what the Lord accomplished on the cross well he okay the cross, let me, let, me, let me word it this way. What Jesus did by dying on the cross and rising again from the dead, theologically fulfills all the, the laws that he needs. He has basically, because it's a legal battle too against the devil, okay? What we face with the devil is a legal battle. You know, there's the law, right? The strength of sin is what? The law. The sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. And he is the accuser of the brethren. Jesus Christ is our advocate. The wages of sin is death. He, there, it's a real legal battle. It's the biggest legal battle ever. It's a terrible thing. So the devil has to function according to the law of God. And God himself functions within the law he has written. So if we're guilty legally, there's nothing that... If, if, if legally we're, we're damned, there's nothing that God can do. In the sense of without breaking his law. And he's not going to break his law. That's why God couldn't just say, yeah, I forgive you. Because in a lot of religions, it's like that. In Islam, that's how it works. In a lot of religions, it's, well, well, you just have to repent. Just tell God that you repent. Tell him, you know, I'm sorry and stop doing it. And God says, yeah, I forgive you. The God of the Bible can't do that. He can't. He says, but my law says the wages of sin is death. You have to die. There's no way around it. So the only, that's why Jesus has to, had to come and die. I mean, you think about it. Why did God just say, I forgive you in the name of Jesus? Why does he have to Jesus die so he can forgive us? Because he can't break the law. The wages of sin is death. So somebody's going to pay the debt. And it has to be somebody that can represent you. If I'm in a store and my kid breaks something, who pays? 
not the kid, right? So under that same kind, and that's legally, that's how it's uphold, upholded in court. And that's why God has to become man. Now he says, I can represent him. He says, well, they deserve to die. I'm paying for it in full. Okay, the law is satisfied. That's why you can be forgiven. So the law has to be satisfied. Our God is very holy. That's why, that's why I believe the God of that book. He doesn't, he doesn't break his law for anything and for anybody. So uh, the Bible says in Hebrews that, he dis that the Lord came so he can destroy him that had the power of death, even the devil. And the Bible says, by reason of whom were, uh, many were all their lifetime, all were all their lifetime subject to bondage through fear of death. The devil had a legal power over us as sinners. This is why when the uh, angel, when Michael the archangel dis has a dispute over the body of Moses, Jude reveals that before the resurrection of Christ. Jude tells us, the apostle Jude tells us that uh, Michael and the devil clashed over the body of Moses. Michael's trying to get the body resurrected. And the devil is saying, basically, you can't. And the devil is right. You can't resurrect him. He's a sinner. You're, you're kind of cheating. And Michael's basically, well, take it up with my boss. You know, the Lord rebuke thee. The Lord on a credit card payment, so to speak, got Moses resurrected before the time. Because we only get the right to the resurrection after the resurrection of Christ. So that was a, it was a preemptive resurrection. And the devil had a point. And that's why Michael himself couldn't say you're wrong. Michael had to say, this is the Lord rebuked thee. Take it up with the Lord. He sent me. So, well, you're, is God breaking the law? No, he's going to pay for that. That's what a credit card system is. Credit card system, it's a promise to pay. You check it, they, they give it to you, and then, but then the, 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 the payment comes. So um, that's what Old Testament salvation was like. The, the, the sacrifices of all those animals were momentary covered they, for their sins, but they couldn't take away sins completely. They went to Abraham's bosom. So all those sacrifices of living uh, bulls and goats were like the credit card payment. You still had to do the credit card payment though, you understand? People say, well, they can't save you. The Bible says they can't save you. Yes, but you still had to do it, okay? The credit card is not the payment. It's not. But I can't just go walk into the store. Well, the credit card is not a real payment, so I can take this thing and walk out. They still have to give the credit card payment. Okay, so that's why people see verses like the Hebrews 10, 4, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. And they say, they weren't doing anything for the sins of sacrifices. No, you're right. They can't take away sins, but they still had to be offered. And if they weren't offered, you went to hell. Just like if you walk out of the store without the credit card, the cops get you. So the Lord basically turns the tables around. The devil thinks he's winning. And it turns out that the Lord is actually fulfilling the law. And then when he walks off, he says, hey, payment is done. You can't be executioner anymore because I just cleared them. Amen. He takes the legal, and this is important, he takes the judicial power away from the devil. That's what he robs him of. And what does he, what does he rob him of? Because he did spoil. He says he's spoiling them through the cross. What did the Lord literally spoil? Yeah. Right. He says you bind the strong men, then you uh, spoil his goods, the Lord says in the Gospels. Remember what the Bible says about those who were in Abraham's bosom when he went down? that he led captivity, captive, captivity is the captives. Who are we the captives of? The devil, he has the judicial power. Now the payment is not made to the devil. The payment for our sins is made to God, not the devil, okay? But the devil is, he's the, you know, the, the, you know, the executions of the guys with the black hat there and they have the big hammer or the la guillotine or whatever it is, that's the devil. C'est le joaillier. He's in charge of the prison and he has the legal power. He's the crown prosecutor. And so basically the Lord comes down. He says, let him go. <laughs> oh man. I, uh, if we could have just been there, man. I, I'm sure the Lord will show us all these things. will replay all these things for us. You know, just walks in and says, let him go. What let him go? Those are sinners. He says, yeah, I know, but I just paid, I, I just paid for everybody. <laughs> I paid, I put, and this is more than bail. This is justification. They're all out. It says he led captivity captive. So the Lord takes him and the devil is just sitting there and all the devils of hell, and everybody's filing out one after another, one after another, just empties the places. Here, here you go. You're staying here though. <laughs> and he takes him out. That is not, that's not, it shall bruise thy head. Now that is future. It has not happened at the cross. And that is literal. Wasn't this literal? Wasn't the death of Christ on the cross literal? Yeah, it was. <clears throat> it was. In fact, there's something kind of cool that happens here. 
You know that Judas was a devil, eh? Uh, not possessed. He gets possessed later. Before he gets possessed, before Satan enters into him. In John chapter 6, verse 7, the Lord says, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Okay? Uh, uh, and the Bible talks about the sin of his mother in the Psalms of Judas. So, Judas's mom did some weird stuff. And Judas was a part man, part devil. Well, that guy... In the Psalms, it says, He that eateth bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. There's a famous psalm. One of those psalms that talks about Judas. There's a few of them. I think 35, 55, 109. I think there's about four of them. And the only time that would have happened where Judas could, was in a position physically to lift up his heel against Jesus was when Jesus Christ was washing their feet because he was there. Here, Jesus Christ is down there and they're sitting and he's washing their feet. And, it's, and the implication is that it crosses Judas' mind to just lift up his heel against him in an absolute reversal of that because the devil knows the prophecies that the, the heel of Jesus goes on his head and Judas tries to kind of switch it around. This thing is physical. He got beaten up. So you can be sure that his feet got beaten up too. Of course, we know that both heels were bruised. For sure, how? Right, okay. So that's physical. It hasn't happened. You can't say Jesus dying on the cross and taking the judicial power of death away from the devil is bruising his head. And the way that you know that's still future, look in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Look in Romans chapter 16. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. Right? See that? Bruise. The God of peace shall bruise Satan, under your feet, the heel, our heels, when? Sure. So not yet. Is Paul writing after the cross? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even after the cross, Paul is telling us, there's still coming a time in the future where you guys are going to bruise Satan under your feet. So the cross couldn't have been it. You know where the, the, the image is taken from? And this is amazing. It's amazing. That shows you how many things apply to us from the Old Testament. We don't even know it. That image of the devil being under our feet because of Jesus, of course, through Jesus Christ. Look in Joshua chapter 10. That's where it's taken from. And you know what Joshua's name is in the New Testament? Jesus. It's the same name. Joshua chapter 10 and look in verse uh, 24. And it came to pass, uh, verse uh, wait, 24. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua... That Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. And then he goes on to say, this is what God's going to do for you. Don't be afraid. Paul takes that and he says, God's going to do that to you shortly. Um, there's quite a few verses in the Bible that talk about the Lord decapitating the Antichrist. Uh, there, it's not for nothing that uh, we forget about, a bit about that. You know, David, when he slays Goliath, uh, he sends that stone right between, right to the head, right in the seat of knowledge, right? The stone sinks into his forehead and he falls down on the ground. What does David do next? Takes a sword and cuts off it. The Bible says he stood. He stood upon him. Under your feet shortly. David stands upon him, cuts off his head. And where does he take his head to? Jerusalem. That's a picture of the Lord uh, de decapitating the Antichrist. And there's, there's a ton of verses if you want. I can't find them right now because my notes are in Genesis are still kind of jumbled up. I'm concentrating on Daniel for now. Uh, one day I'll have to order those notes in Genesis. But there's a whole a series of verses on it. So when the Lord comes back at the Battle of Armageddon, the Antichrist is taken alive, man. You can be sure what Joshua did is a picture because what Joshua did is a picture of Jesus Christ coming back and taking over the land. You can be sure the Lord Jesus Christ is going to bring that serpent out. The cause of all our troubles. He's going to lay him on the ground just like Joshua did with the elders of Israel. And he's going to say, guys, he's going to ask the church. Oh, man. I love it, man. Because he defiled a woman. And Eve is a type of the church. So what it is is the Lord's going to tell, hey, Eve, come. Put your foot on. on and, and Eve's going to... I... I um, it's not the most spiritual song in the world, but whenever I, I think about that doctrine, I, I remember this, uh, there was a song by uh, Sinatra's daughter. 
oh, I forget her name, but she sings, these boots are made for walking, and that's just what they'll do. One of these days, these boots are gonna walk all over you. Oh man, I love it, man. That's, that's, that is exactly what we're gonna do, and literally, literally, I just wanna see that serpent squirm under our feet. You know, the Lord's gonna get uh, his vengeance for Eve and for all the Christians and for the church and for Israel. You better believe it, man. I want a physical victory over that guy. Our curse was physical, our problems are physical. Okay, so there's, uh, now, so what that is, the only time, Jesus Christ on the cross, Paul calls it the weakness of God in Corinthians. But he says the weakness of God is stronger than men. The closest the devil got was to hurt Jesus' heel at the crucifixion. So you know what that makes that? That makes this the first coming. And that makes that the second coming. Isn't that beautiful? And they're in reverse order, like they often are in the Bible. Like they often are in the Bible. In reverse order. Many, 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 many times the first and second coming are in reverse order. Psalm 68 is about the second coming. Psalm 69 is about the first coming. The whole psalm. Many times the Bible does that. Now, the reason why the Christians can't see that, that this is second coming, first coming, you know what we have a hard time with as Gentiles? What was the problem of the Jews? The Jews had a hard time seeing the first coming, didn't they? Right? Come on, you're the Messiah. If you're the Messiah, get those Romans out. Get the kingdom going and give me a place of authority with you in the kingdom. That's a, and they like, no, the Messiah doesn't die. So they, they could see this easily. They can't see this. We have the opposite problem. We can see the first coming easily. We can't see the second coming easily. No, the Lord's not really going to come and kill the Antichrist. Yeah, he will. He absolutely will. Uh, verse 16, so we're finishing up... Uh, then that's good. If we can finish up chapter 3 and take a break, that's good. Uh, now, sadly, it's our turn now to get, to get some of the ch -ch -ch -ch. So he did one to the, he slapped the serpent around there. And now uh, we're going to get slapped around a bit. But of course, not the similar, at least as a loving father. Verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. And the, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule uh, over, thee, lit, uh, over thee. Later on, we're going to see in verse 20 that it's possible. It's possible. There's no Bible contradiction at all that Eve probably already had children. Okay, because the Lord says, I'm going to multiply your conception. We'll see that in a second. And that kind of uh, helps answer where King God is wife. Uh, so... The birth rate increases... Which is not easy. Not easy. Uh, I think I don't want to call it a mistake, but people, some people are saying, you know, get all the kids together, all close together, so they can grow up as friends. You get really, really tired for a few years, and then you rest. And then some other people are saying, no, it's like a marathon. You know, space them out if you can. And and uh, I'm telling you, we had three in under five years. My sister had four boys in under five years, and it's exa it's exhausting. <laughs> okay, especially on the woman, it's exhausting. It really is a problem. Uh, he says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and conception, but like with the Lord, when every time, every time, his punishments are, are not just punitive, but they're corrective. You know, they're corrective. There's something good coming out of the punishment. It's not just like, I'm going to hurt you because you did something wrong. It's, I'm going to punish you, but you're going to learn something through the punishment, and the punishment itself is going to minister some kind of grace to you, uh, the fruit of righteousness, and he says in Hebrews. So, the multiplication of the conception would make sense given that the Lord just ordained death for us. How are you going to keep... You'd have to, the rate of death is pretty high in a sinful world. In a wicked world, right? So how do you keep, how do you keep mankind going? Because well, we would all die and then the generations would die out. So along with the increased death rate, the Lord increases the birth rate. Isn't God wise, man? It's just He balances His creation out. That's quite the thing to do. Quite the thing to do. And I sorrow. So they call them the mammy blues and, and uh, baby, uh, what do they call uh, Postpartum. There's a term for it, man. Postpartum blues. Something like that. Post, you know, after a woman gives birth, she has joy in the moment, but then like she hits kind of, when she rises, her life is completely transformed. She hits a ditch for a while. Um, it, 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 and sometimes they're just sad and you're like, what's wrong? Is something, they just, you can't put your finger on it. <laughs> exactly why. 
There's a spiritual thing there. It's almost like a, you know that the pain should not have been part of it. It's a, it's a wonderful experience and turns out into a painful one, very, very painful one and, and a very dangerous one. Uh, in fact, many women die in childbearing, sadly. Now that, that sorrow that the woman feels while she's carrying uh, her baby, you know that that curse, Adam was the head of creation. Adam was the king, but Eve was the queen. And uh, whatever blessings she had trickled down to, to nature and whatever curses she had trickled down to nature. So you know that you find out in Job that the animals were affected by that curse? Listen to what Job says. He says, uh, sorry, what God says about, uh, about the calves. Uh, he says, they bow themselves, they bring forth their young ones, they cast out their sorrows. So that God's saying that the animals can feel a certain, now not a human kind of sorrow, but they, that the God himself is saying, they cast out their sorrows. You can, sell, you can tell when a dog is like down, you know? Now I know what happens here. Here it's like, you know, in the weight nature animal worship, right? It's like, you know, but, but they do feel sorrow. And uh, Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8 that not, well, not only do we groan as a result of those curses, but all of the creatures groan, the animals groan. Man, they have a hard life. Animals have a hard life. So what in the world does that mean? Thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall uh, rule over thee. Um, the, word, the words of that, that, that's a controversial kind of statement. Nobody's quite sure what exactly that, that means. But the words will bear a couple of simultaneously valid readings in the light of scripture, history, and psychology. If you read it on its own, this is verse um, 16. Are we in 16? And if you read it on its own, thy desire shall be to thy husband is readily understood by any sane observer, which rules out most social studies, humanities, and psychology doctors. Mentally, as opposed to sexually, this is where most men live. A woman's yearning, her desire for a man is greater than a man's uh, yearning for a woman. Mentally. Mentally. Okay? I'm not going to say sexual. So, a guy, look, there's all kinds of studies about this. All kinds. And, and the consensus, it doesn't matter what, if you're leftist, rightist, whatever, the consensus amongst all clinical psychological studies is that men are more interested in things and women are more interested in uh, people. Uh, if you, um, if, if the most kind of progressive, if you will, the most kind of liberal countries that people think of in their minds when it comes to that kind of stuff, uh, gender equality and all that kind of stuff would be the Scandinavian countries. They put a lot of pressure, a lot. They poured a lot of money into getting more women, uh, uh, like into engineering and more men to being nurses. They really, really, really put like huge programs together. You know where the greatest disparity between those two genders is in those fields? In the Scandinavian countries. In the Scandinavian countries. It, it's, it's, it's just, you, you, can't, you, you can't force those things. Because nursing is, is, I'm not saying men are not tender and compassionate or that women can't be engineers. They absolutely can. They have the mental capacity. What I'm saying is just that's what they prefer, <laughs> okay? Okay? That's, I'm sorry, like, I, 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 you pick me, give me a job, like, I, I don't know, man, with, with, like, kids, 12 hours a day, 10 hours a day uh, in, a nur in a nursery or a daycare, and, and uh, you just put me out of my misery, you know, just, like, Somebody shoot me, you know? I love the kid. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. And then I can go back and I can like get into my project. I can get into my computer. I can get into my garage and build something or do something and not talk for a human being with three days and I'll be fine. I'm not talking, take away the sexual urges. I'm talking about just mentally, okay? Mentally. And, and that's why like you're in the car and they, they, it's more like talk to me, you know, give me some attention. And that's important to understand for the ministry. It really is. Uh, I was, when I was, because this is Bible Institute, you know, so we got to talk ministry, but as, as a young man, I was, I had gone right with God, and I was really zealous, and I, I had this thing in mind that, you know, like, uh, I want to marry a girl that's like all gung-ho to be a missionary, and she's going to like, you know, go die uh, in Saudi Arabia with me, or something like that, you know, some <laughs> stupid thing like that, you know, and because as, as a man, you're kind of focused on the career and you're focused on the ministry and it's very goal-oriented and you, you want somebody by your side, but that's your life. And part of my studies in my Bible Institute, I had to read a book by um, John R. Rice called The Home. Um, and in it, he, he, there was a passage, man, that really, I really got convicted. I wrote on it, this is for you, George, you know. He's saying, he says, look, 
you got to take it easy with that stuff if you're a young man getting into the ministry. He's like, for you, the ministry is your, is your kind of life. He says, for her, you're her life. And you can't expect her. She's not any less spiritual just because she's not as like given to that. And the, the Lord is amazing how temperate and kind he is with those things. It's, it's true. You got to understand the psychology there behind that. So that's why their, their longing is, you know, like an evening for two, just concentrating on each other and just talking is, is wonderful uh, for my wife. And it's wonderful for me too, but my mind is racing. Okay, like racing. Like I can't stop thinking. And I'm, I'm, and I'm thinking, not so I love her, I love, enjoy her presence, but like I'm thinking about like some Bible verses and like chess combinations and, and uh, something I'm going to go study and research after or something I'm going to, you know, it, it's just we're just wired differently. And, and, and that, that difference was already there before the fall. It just got increased after the fall. And you can understand there's some alienation there. You, can you imagine what the next night was after getting kicked out of that garden? Can you imagine what that first night was like? The, the fight? What a fight that must have been. Between Adam and Eve? Dude, you gotta put yourself there. Those guys just got kicked out of paradise. And the cherubims are there and there's a sword of fire. And you're looking there and you're looking out. Because not all the land was like the garden. The garden was planted in the land of Eden. The Bible says the vegetation had not even spread. That took a while for the men to till the land to spread. That's what Genesis chapter 2 talks about. So they're in some kind of wilderness outside. And looking at each other. And for the first time, you know, a mosquito goes. Yeah, and they're like, what is that? You know? And then she gets a headache. Because she's pregnant and she's moody and he's upset and all of a sudden now he's, you know, has to build something and he, he breaks into a sweat because that's what the Lord says in the sweat of thy face. And he cuts his hand on, on the thorn of a rose. She offered her some roses, you know, and she cuts herself. She's like, what is that? You know? And they get into a fight and you can say, well, it's all your fault. You got us into this mess. You, what were you doing talking to that guy anyway? And he's like, well, if you were a more spiritual husband, I wouldn't be looking anywhere, somewhere else. You, know? you can be sure that stuff happened. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was brutal. I'm telling you, the Bible, there's a lot in there. There's a lot in there. So, I know there are exceptions, but by and large, the, the, that's, how this thing, uh, that's how this thing goes. It's just, if you want more information on it, I actually have a, um, um, a, a video on it. It's called, it was actually a sermon that we did on a Wednesday night during the lockdown. It's called Female Psychology 101. So you can check it out on YouTube if you want more details on that. But um, how, one mistake that people do with that verse is they say, well, uh, he shall rule over thee. That's, so it's re as a result of the fall, the woman is in, is in subjection to the man. That's not true. Actually, when Paul writes in the New Testament, he says it's because the man was formed first and because the woman was for formed for man. So that subjection exists before the fall. Okay? Before the fall, not as a result of the fall. It just gets augmented as a result of the fall. And of course, that's just a temporary arrangement on earth and the resurrection. There's, there's no difference. Uh, we're all one in Jesus Christ. But, but you want to keep that in mind that this, this thing existed uh, before, the, before the fall. If you want to know uh, where Paul says that, it's in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Verses 11 uh, to, thir to 14. He advances two reasons. Adam was first, first formed. And um, in Corinthians... In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, he says, because the man is the image and glory of God, and the, and the, and the, the woman was made for the man. It's so beautiful, man. It's just so nice. What a responsibility that puts on men, though, eh, to be good leaders and godly. It's really quite the thing. God help us. Okay. Now, notice that you're going to see it. The woman, even though she's punished, she's the only one that doesn't have a curse connected to her. I know I, I called like the multiplication of sorrow and conception a curse, but the Bible doesn't use that word. It uses the word for serpent. The serpent is cursed, and then we get a curse connected to the land, not the woman. Now, here's, here's our, our turn, uh, us guys now. There's our slap. Verse 17. You know when you're like, kid, the father shows up, he's just ask a few questions. Well, you're all guilty. Schlack, schlack, schlack. <laughs> Everybody gets it, you know. So now it's our turn. Verse 17. 
And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, that's, that's where I was looking for, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. We are not cursed, the ground. In sorrow, that's our part, thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. So, in Genesis there are cataclysmic events that bring all mankind under God's judgment, and they're twice caused by supernatural and external male forces influencing women to influence men for evil. So, you've got a man that influences Eve to influences Adam, and then later on you're going <laughs> to... You're going to get the sons of God that are going to take the women to mess up the men, to get violent. There's always a, they, there's always a man behind it. So, uh, the ground that's cursed is the ground out of which thou was taken. So, this is where we get... Did I read the verse, the next verse after that? About the thorns and thistles? I don't think I did, eh? Okay. Uh, where was it? 18? 18, yeah. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the, gro the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And that's where the roses got the thorns, and the mosquitoes got the, the, the whatever, the stings, and um, all, all those things why you can't enjoy a barbecue. There's literally nothing you can do that doesn't have some kind of fun, that doesn't have some kind of drawback. There's nothing. Nothing. Absolutely. You're going to get, uh, you're going to set up a pool and you're going to have some dirt in the pool and you know, some dead creatures in the pool. You're going to go outside, you're going to have the mosquitoes following you, you're going to go into the woods and so you're going to get bitten by a tick and you're going to get Lyme's disease and uh, then you, you go out for a nice walk and you put a bird house so you can watch the beautiful birds and they poop all over you and all over your backyard and all over your car and all over your head you know it's just you can't escape it the, that's that's our lot it's the, this is that that's how it was look the woman the woman's main sorrow was with her conception and the kids bearing them and then the man most was with the difficulty of work and the problems at work nowadays the, the pressure on the woman is insane they got they got both problems right they're like they, they're like fully in the labor force and they have to deal with the, a lot of times like the, the woman she goes and she works and then she comes back she takes care of the house and the husband and the kids so she's got, <laughs> she's, got she's like partaking of both uh, both afflictions and I think the, the, the reward of the Lord will be accordingly it's a tough thing it's a tough thing so <clears throat> now you start seeing why those things religions are unacceptable to God <coughs> you know what Cain he brought he brought the offering to God out of the fruit of the ground. But that's the ground of which God had just said, cursed is the ground. Now in work, in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat thy bread. You know what that is? Who's the bread of life? Jesus. If you try to get, so it, already God is setting up the principle that sweating and working for your bread is a curse. Work is not a curse. Sometimes we get the wrong idea. Work is not a curse. When God put Adam before the fall, he says, I want you to dress it and to keep it. He was working. The curse is the problems that come with work. The problems that come with it, with the sorrow and, and all the kind of uh, occupational hazard, as it were, of, of just working. It's just what it, my, my, my grandfather was a carpenter. And he, he's, he had a successful carpenter. And one day, he's, 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 those, those table saws like this, you know, he was cutting something and a worker asked him some question, he lifted up his head, he's talking to him and he's pushing the piece of wood and the saw grabbed onto the piece of wood and pulled the wood and by reflex he held onto the wood and it, it just went through his, uh, his two fingers. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it is, that's, that, that's what life is. Uh, so, the, the, there's our curse, if you're trying to earn your heaven, the bread of life through, uh, through the, your works, that's a curse. At the same time, sweat is healthy for us. So nowadays, what we're trying to do is we're trying to overturn the curses of God. So mankind, without the need of God, without Jesus Christ and the grace of God, the forgiveness, we are going to recreate our garden without you. That's why we're going to work. I don't need Jesus. I don't need the church. I don't need the Bible. I can work. I can work hard. I can have a successful career. I'm going to buy a nice house and I'm going to build me a garden and I'll hire somebody to kill the mosquitoes and I'll hi hire somebody to pluck out the weeds from the backyard and the front yard, right? I'll hire the best doctor there is. I'll hire, I'll, you know, for my wife. So she doesn't, we're trying to kind of fix it and then I don't have to sweat 
And today we're so evolved and we're so advanced that we don't have to labor in agriculture like uh, back in the day. 2% of the population is farmers, everybody else is in products and services. And I can sit and kind of, you know, trade online all the day long and I don't have to sweat. And then, and then you get a heart attack at 52 years old or whatever it is. <laughs> or something, you have chest pains, and you go see the physician, and the physician says, you've got high cholesterol, sir. Like, what am I gonna do? Well, you have to sweat. <laughs> so now you go back to the gym, and you're paying the gym. So you're paying the gym, so you can, you can sweat what you thought you were avoiding. And you're right back where God put you. You just can't, you just know there, you can't escape it. Right? <laughs> Please, I need to sweat so I can live. <laughs> Okay, look in Matthew chapter 27. There's nothing that the Lord lays on us that he doesn't take himself. Nothing. <coughs> nothing. What a God. Matthew chapter 27, verse 29. Verse 29. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head. And a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. The last Adam... First Adam is cursed. We produce thorns in this world. That is a what a thing it is that you know people say like we're connected to the earth and the earth is our mother. It's pretty. It's actually the other way around in the Bible. I know we're taken from the earth, but what we do brings a curse on the earth. We're the head of the earth, and we're not stewards of the earth. We are not. The Bible doesn't say we're stewards. We're stewards of a lot of things, not of the earth. The earth is our possession. That's very clear in the Bible. We, we dominate it where it's masters. And when we fall, it falls. And when we rise, it rises with us. Uh, but here, what the Lord is doing, the, the wounds in his body are to, are to redeem us. The wounds in the body is to be able to redeem our body. But the wounds of his soul are to redeem our soul. Because he says, thou wilt not leave my soul where? In hell. The wounds of the thorn, so what is the crown of thorns for? Because Adam was a king. And you know that in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says that Adam was, he crowned him with glory and honor. Adam and Eve were king, Adam and Queen Eve. Um, so now, God redeems mankind's body and soul, but there's something else that has to be redeemed. Creation. The curse of creation was the thorns. So when he takes the thorns upon him, he's paying the price to take off the curse off of nature. And sure enough, in the millennial kingdom, what do you, need about, what do you read about nature? That the animals aren't killing each other anymore. That the, the bear and the cow are going to feed together. The lion and the lamb are together. And even the asps, the vipers lose their fangs and a little child plays on the hole of the asp. Except, the, that, by the way, that's the only curse that's not overturned in the millennial kingdom. There's one curse that's not overturned. The serpent... He keeps on eating dust, Isaiah says. He keeps on eating dust. <clears throat> verse 20. Is it verse 20? Did we get to verse 20? Yeah, okay, almost done. Verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve. Now there it is. Because she was the mother of all living. We kind of play, juggle with that. Schofield says, well, he did it by faith because he believed she would be, uh, come on. She was the mother of all living. That implies pretty strongly that there was some kids around already, which makes sense now when the Lord says, I'm going to, okay, multiply my conception. What does that mean if she hasn't had kids? It doesn't mean anything. But multiply my conception was already a few when she's already had some, and now it's going to be in sorrow. She must have had them first in pleasure uh, uh, to understand what the curse is. Otherwise, it's a meaningless, almost curse. Um, she was the mother, she was the mother of all living. Uh, so now, so now here's the question. You say, yeah, but then, but then they would have been born after the fall of Adam and Eve, and they would not have been affected by sin, and they would be uh, immortal, and then not all men would have been affected. Not the case. That's not the case. Let me ask you this. Did, 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 did the animals start to die as a result of Adam's sin? Yeah, absolutely. Did Adam beget the animals? No, you don't have to be a child of Adam to die. You just had to be under Adam's authority. And those kids would have died like everything else because they were, begot they were begotten of Adam. Um, uh, they would have died anyway, <clears throat> even if it was after the fall. The, you, you, had, you had animals before the fall that were alive and that died as a result of Adam's sin. So everything else would have died, including any kids they might have had before. 
this is why Cain, everyone's like, we, we kind of have some answers for Cain's wife, but there's some issues with all of them. So I, I don't teach that as 100%. Um, I think it's already on YouTube too. I, we, I go through it, but uh, you can make a pretty strong case about that. Okay, verse 21. Anyway, not super important, but interesting nonetheless. Verse 21. Unto Adam also unto his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. We already saw a bit of that. This is a sacrifice, a bloody sacrifice for the Lord to cover us with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> Skins involve sacrifice, and for the first time, mankind is being taught the lesson that something innocent has to die for something guilty. Because those, those two lambs didn't do anything. <laughs> I mean, that's quite a sight for Adam. Now listen, that's an object lesson. Here's God, he brings the two lambs. Adam and Eve don't know anything about death. The concept is not even there. Even the trees don't die. Nothing dies. Everything is immortal. The animals too would live on forever. And those two lambs are, are, are brought together and the Lord you know, says, put your hands on, the, on, the, on, the, on their heads and confess your sin. And Adam and Eve put their heads on. And the Lord takes out a knife and slits their throat right there and first time red blood comes pouring out and then he skins them and covers them. You know what a feeling that is? You walk away and you are like in charge of that creation. And you walk away. The only way you can walk away is because those two innocent little things died for you. Of course, the picture of the Lamb, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Well, we can be saved. Verse, uh, that's why I believe Adam and Eve make it, make it, by the way. Some people teach that Adam and Eve were lost. I don't believe that because the Lord atoned for their sin. Verse 22, and the Lord God said, behold, oh, that's interesting stuff, man. And the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as, as one of us. That isn't the Trinity. God is not the Queen of England speaking in the we, or the royal we. That's one of us, so that's distinct. That shows you that God can use the term one to identify each of the three members of the Trinity. One of us. To know good and evil. So we did get that knowledge. That's why the devil was not a complete liar. He just lied about one part. He just lied about one part. I don't know what that means. I re you, you can, we can spend quite a time. We can spend a lot on this. What exactly does that mean? That we have the knowledge of good and evil. That's it, in the Bible. To be able, the ability to, to differentiate between good and evil is, an, is a divine attribute. It's a divine attribute. And what the implication is for the angels. There's all kinds of stuff you can ask about that. Uh, there. How did the devil start sinning? There are all kinds of stuff you can ask about that. So, uh, and now, and the rest of the verse says, and now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. <clears throat> the Lord did us an act of mercy by not letting us go back in. So, and by the way, that shows you man's free will. God says they can come back in and eat of the tree of life and they would live forever. That's what he said. So if, if the Lord had allowed us to go back in, take of that tree and eat, we would be sinners, eternally decaying and unable to die because both laws would have been functioning in our bodies. Eternal life would have been at, at, at work in your body and an eternal dying. Which is basically the devil. You know how what, what a what a fate that would have been. Terrible. Terrible. It's like imagine that you're 250 years old, the way you decay and unable to die. Yeah, or 2,000, constantly being degraded and unable to fully die. Something always sustaining that. The pain of that. That's just just. The Lord did us an act of mercy. That wasn't a. But He had a plan for us to restore us to back to eternal life. But first, He had to die. He had to die for that. Now. That tree of life and the access to the tree of life, you're going to see it back all the way. From Genesis, we're kicked out. And all the way, it, it kind of pops up a bit in, uh, in Ezekiel. But uh, a, all the way back to Revelation chapter 22. And Revelation chapter 21, forgive me. I think 22 too. In Revelation chapter 21, you have the tree of life that pops, pops back up again. And the Bible says that the trees of the leaves, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So that... That is closed off 
up until the millennial kingdom when people will have started having access again to the tree of life. That's quite, that's quite the loss. But so the Bible uh, is a full circle. Us, we're a bit of an exception. The church age. We don't. So in the Bible, the people in the millennium are going to de derive their healing and their eternal life from that tree. Not us. The church is different. Our life is Christ. Colossians chapter 3. When Christ who is our life shall appear. We don't need the tree anymore. Because Jesus Christ is the tree of life. And we are actually one in him now. So we're a bit of a uh, special breed the way we got our eternal life. <clears throat> uh, verse 23, yeah. He sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. I already spoke about how that's a picture of the temple. Remember that? The cherubims are on the east gate and you can't come back in. There's a flaming sword that answers to the altar that keeps, uh, uh, keeps you out. And now, Adam is in the same position. Those cherubims are in a corresponding position to Adam as Adam was to the devil. Adam was inside the garden and he had to keep the devil out. And now you have, who's a cherub, and now you have cherubims keeping Adam out and the devil's out. And now everybody's outside. <laughs> you know what a blow that is? How much that must have burned Adam? When he became, so, and, and the, the devil, that was the plan. I sinned, you kicked me out, I'm gonna show you, they're gonna sin too. They're not any better than me. They're going to sin too, and you're going to have to kick them out too. Because the thing we hurt the most, if you want to put yourself in the devil's shoes, imagine that you are a brilliant, brilliant creature. And, and the, the, the owner of the company puts you as the CEO, and you're like the son-in-law, let's say. And you're absolutely brilliant, and then you, you, you cheat him. You try to take him out, he kicks you out, and as, a, as, a, as an insult, as insult to injury, he doesn't replace you with another cherub. You know, God could have done that. He could have replaced Lucifer with another cherub. There's other cherubims or a seraphim. The Lord says, no, you know what? I'm going to replace you with a guy made of dust. That hurts. The one thing, you know what it hurts? Is getting fired and getting replaced by somebody who's far less competent. What is the most thing you want them to do most? To fail and fail miserably. So you can just throw it back. Doesn't that, aren't, we, aren't we like that? Somebody, or and we're like that. The Bible's amazing. The girl dumps you, or a guy dumps you. You know what you want him to do with the next girlfriend? You want him to completely fail and say, should have you know, stuck with me, you know? That's exactly how the devil hates us, because we're the replacements, and we are. He is disgusted by us, and to a certain extent, he's kind of right, because we're just dust. <laughs> the God did it to humble him. <laughs> you know? We're nothing, man. We're like, we're nothing. Compared to the angels, we're at the top of, of uh, the, the animals, but the angels are above us. And they're immortal. They're just like, they're made of spirit. So we're driven out of God, from God's presence. And we're driven from God, out of, from God eastward, by the way. There's all kinds of, uh, you're going to see that completely. That When you walk to God in the temple, you go east to west. When Abraham comes back to the land, he's east to west. And a lot of times in the, in, in the Bible, the, the elders in the book of Ezekiel, they're worshiping the sun towards the east. Cain is driven eastward. Adam is driven eastward. And so that's why looking eastward for truth is dangerous in the Bible. So, what are we driven for? Okay, so we're driven out and we're dying for what? For rape? For murder? For robbing a bank? This is good to use when you're witnessing to somebody. Well, you know, well, you know, I never robbed a bank. I'm not such a bad person, you know? And especially if they're a Catholic or a Muslim because they believe kind of that stuff. You can use that. It's very helpful. What, what, what did God kick, kick out Adam and Eve for? Did they kill anyone? Did they commit sacrilege or blasphemy? All they did was they ate a fruit. And for eating a fruit, God says out. But they, they committed one sin and it was death. So it's not a question of like, do, do I, you know, yeah, I sin, but I repent and I do more good than bad. One sin is enough to get you killed. It's game over. The day you committed your first sin, it's game over. And you need the sacrifice of a lamb to cover for, for you. You need the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to, to cover for you. <clears throat> 